Okay, our picture of an ideal disciple. We've been talking about the ideal disciple. And it shows uh, an individual with arms raised while holding a Bible. Those arms are not a signal for don't shoot or the field goal is good. Rather, these raised arms are a symbol for worship. And the point the picture is making is that worshiping the Lord is something those who trust and follow Jesus do. We're worshipers. And it's something that disciples of Jesus encourage other believers to do. Now, I will note that many times, especially in the Old Testament, we are told that God's people raised or lifted their hands as they worshiped or prayed. For example, Psalm 63, 4 says, I will bless you as long as I live. I will lift up my hands in your name. And it's certainly appropriate for anyone at Chisholm Baptist to raise their hands when they're worshiping the Lord. Yet, I, I don't think this is something we're necessarily commanded to do. You can engage in God-honoring worship while raising your hands, while folding your hands, or even sitting on your hands. Because it's not the position of your hands, but of your heart. Your heart that really matters in worship. And, and let's just pause and pray that as we explore various dimensions of worship this morning, that the Lord would use his word to help us have hearts that are in the right position when we worship. Thank you, Father, for, again, another chance to hear what you have to say to us through your word. And we pray that you will enable us to listen, to understand, to believe, and then to obey. Help us by your grace and for your glory. In Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, six points to ponder. Number one. An ideal disciple worships the Lord. I already said that. But, but what exactly does worship mean? Well, in both the uh, Old and New Testament, pri uh, primarily uh, Hebrew in the Old Testament, Greek in the New Testament, the word translated worship means to bow down. In fact, in the Old Testament, the Hebrew term uh, shakah is sometimes translated into English as worship. But other times it's translated as bow down. And in the ancient and often in the modern world, this means to bow down, it means to give homage or honor. And worship certainly includes expressions of praise and adoration, and yet often worship implicitly includes acknowledging and submitting to God's authority. One definition of worship I like is this. Worshiping God means acknowledging and celebrating his power and perfection in gratitude. <laughs> We're grateful as we celebrate and acknowledge his power and perfection. Now, sometimes uh, Christians will say, well, really, all of life is to be worshipped because all of life is to be lived for the glory of God. And thus, you can... Uh, Worship while you're pouring cement, you can worship when you're baking a cake, you can worship when you're playing pickleball, or when you're taking a nap. As long as you're doing that activity with the right attitude, which means doing it with gratitude and for the glory of God, it's worship. Well, that, that's, that's true. In, in Romans 12, 1, the Apostle Paul tells us, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Everything you do, again, is done for God's glory. It should be done for God's glory. And yet, when the Bible speaks of worship, <laughs> the vast majority of the times, it involves being focused on acknowledging and celebrating who God is and what he's done. Acknowledging and celebrating who God is and what he's done. So that's what we're going to mean by worship today. That time where we acknowledge and celebrate who God is and what he's done. Okay, that's number one. An ideal disciple worships. Secondly, an ideal disciple worships in private as well as in public. 
Uh, now, our focus today will be on corporate worship, but worship was never intended to be a one-hour-a-week activity. Again, we're not talking about gratefully taking a nap and, and calling that worship. Uh, we're to be... You're not supposed to do that here, either. We, <laughs> we, we are to be expressing our adoration praise and gratitude and love for the Lord through prayer, through song, or, or through other ways that we might express our thoughts and our emotions. That's worship. Now, certainly your devotional time, your quiet time, is a great opportunity to worship the Lord as you offer uh, prayers of, of praise and, and thanksgiving. Uh, singing when you are by yourself, singing Hymns and, and praise songs can be a great way to worship the Lord. And some of you might be more comfortable singing uh, when you're in the shower than when singing where other people can hear you. So sing to the Lord. I, when I was in high school, I used to sing hymns when I was milking the cows. Um, yeah, I might have been a little eccentric, but... Um, uh, it, it was part of my worshiping the Lord, and I had actually read this article saying that, you know, when cows hear people singing, it helps them relax and produce more milk. So it was a, a moneymaker as well. Folks, my point is there are a variety of, of ways that you can worship the Lord privately, and if you love God as disciples of Jesus should, then that's something you will do, worship the Lord not only publicly, but in private. Which brings us to number three. Corporate worship, or we might say public worship, is an important, is very important to an ideal disciple. You know, during the past three and a half years, COVID and all that surrounds it has caused both churches and individual Christians to reevaluate the importance of gathering with other believers. And, and actually here at Chisholm Baptist, our worship services have been available remotely through local cable TV for almost 30 years. I think it's like 28 years. Our, you could be home on Wednesday evening and, and watch the, the service from Sunday morning. Um, providentially, we had made updates to our video equipment before COVID hit and were uh, well prepared to do virtual online church for those weeks in the spring of 2020 when we were not gathering for in-person services. And, and, and during that time, we learned a, a couple of things. First of all, it is a wonderful thing, a wonderful thing to have online church available for folks who are shut-ins, who have health issues, who are working weekend shifts, or maybe they're just fighting a head cold. Uh, or have a kid who's fighting a head cold and they have to stay home. Uh, some people have also found it beneficial to occasionally go back and listen to a sermon a second time. You know, maybe on Monday evening trying to figure out what in the world was Pastor Tan talking about yesterday morning. Uh, online worship services are also a great way for people not familiar with our church to find out, well, what happens there on Sundays? Because believe it or not, some folks in our community are actually afraid to be in a Baptist church on Sunday morning. Yet 92.7% of people who watch a uh, Chisholm Baptist service online in the privacy of their home realize there's no reason to be afraid to come here. I just made up that 92.7%, but... <laughs> and as they're watching, maybe just watching out of curiosity... They will hear God's word. <laughs> They'll hear the gospel. And the Lord <laughs> may use that to, to change their lives. And, and really, it's a wonderful thing to have online church available. But the second thing we learned in the spring of 2020 is that online church is no substitute for in-person gathering of Christian believers. When the Lord tells us, Hebrews 10, 25, do not neglect to meet together, as is the habit of some, he intends that we be in the same room with other Christians. 
Now, yes, when, when it comes to sermons, you can listen online or on the radio and, and have pretty close to the same experience. What, what you can't do, however, in virtual church is have fellowship. <laughs> You can't. You can't have the encouragement and accountability that comes from true, genuine fellowship. And if you're, you know, typing a few words in a chat box, it just, just doesn't do it. Another component when we gather on Sunday mornings is corporate worship. And yes, the sermon and fellowship are, are part of that overall worship experience, but again, I'm referring to when we're focused on acknowledging and celebrating who God is and, and what he's done. That, again, is what, what I mean by corporate worship. Yeah, you can sing along with the worship songs when you're watching online, and, and that's a good thing to do. But, but it's not the same. G gathering with other believers, singing songs of praise, hearing others express adoration and thanksgiving to the Lord through their prayers, that's something you can't do in front of a screen. So it's important for a disciple of Jesus to gather with other Christians for corporate worship on a regular basis. What's regular, Pastor Dan? <laughs> well, once a week is good. When you're able to do that, you know, there's no command in the scripture that says you have to gather to worship the Lord on, on, on Sunday mornings. But that's a long-standing tradition, like 2,000 years tradition. Uh, the Christians have been doing that <laughs> since the beginning of the church, gathering on the first day of the week to celebrate Jesus' resurrection and worship him. Now, there's nothing wrong with gathering for worship more frequently. In fact, that can be a very, it's very good for your soul to do that. But I think meeting with other Christians uh, at the once a week is a good goal for you to have as a disciple. A disciple, again, someone who believes in Jesus and is seeking to follow him. Gather with other Christians to worship once a week. A great goal. And it's also what we should encourage other believers to do. And it's not just the pastor's job to do that. All of us should be encouraging each other to be regular participants in corporate worship. Not naggers, don't nag but encourage. Number four, the goal, especially in corporate worship, the goal should be to worship in spirit and in truth. John chapter four, one of, one of, one of the great chapters of the Bible. They're all good, but they're all great, but this is a really great one. John chapter four, we read about a conversation Jesus has with a woman who was a Samaritan. It is a remarkable conversation for a number of reasons. There's a long history, a long history of uh, intention between Jews and Samaritans. Anyway, Jesus has this conversation with a Samaritan woman, and she brings up the fact that the Samaritans uh, gathered to worship God uh, on Mount Gerizim. Well, the Jews believed, no, you, you need to go to the temple in Jerusalem to truly worship God. So there was a disagreement there. But then Jesus says, this is starting in verse 21, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain, Gerizim, nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Now, the first thing that text tells us, Jesus tells us, is that worship does not depend on where you are. You know, I just talked about the importance of gathering for corporate worship, but there is no particular place that you need to be to worship. And really, this room is not a, this is not a sacred space uh, uh, of some type. This is a meeting place, a, a place where all of us are able to come together to worship the Lord. However, worship is not about this or any other place. 
Secondly, this text tells us that worship is to be done in spirit and truth. That's a, that's a very important statement, but unfortunately there is uh, some disagreement about what the words mean. Some say the spirit in which worship is to be done, a genuine, sincere godliness, uh, rather than in the hypocritical spirit uh, and legalism of the Pharisees. That's Jesus' point. You have the right spirit. Um, Others say, no, 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 the word spirit should be capitalized because it refers to the Holy Spirit, who is the one who enables to worship as we ought. And, and as far as truth, there are various suggestions about what particular truth should be the focus of worship. And, and I think most of these understandings reflect part of, of what Jesus means. Spirit, spirit, both good. But, but I believe the key is what Jesus says in verse 23. The hour is coming and is now here. The hour is coming and is now here. He's talking about the end of Old Covenant worship. What, what, what was being done in the temple in Jerusalem and the, the beginning of New Covenant worship, which can be done wherever people, wherever God's people gather. New Covenant worship is indeed empowered by the Spirit, capital S, who enables us to worship with a new spirit, small s, of love for the Lord. New Covenant worship is certainly built on the truth of who God is and what he has done, and most significantly, on what he's done for us through Jesus. In other words, New Covenant worship is a celebration of the gospel of the rich salvation that is ours through Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. And thus, I, I can't go along with my friends who want to use only God-inspired songs in worship, meaning we should only use the Psalter, we should only use the Psalms, the book of Psalms, because those are the songs that God inspired. And, and yeah, that, that's true, they are inspired by God, but they're also rooted in the Old Covenant. And it's still very appropriate to sing these psalms, but it's also important to sing hymns and, and spiritual songs, Ephesians 5.19, that celebrate the New Covenant and all the blessings that God gives us and promises through Jesus. So as you may have noticed, we sing a lot of those type of songs here at Chisholm Baptist. We sing old hymns and new hymns and, and, and worship songs on Sunday mornings, N not because they're cool uh, melodies or because they're real popular on the Christian radio station or because they're Pastor Dan's favorites. That's not why we sing these songs. We sing them because they celebrate the new covenant and enable us to worship in spirit and in truth. Worship in spirit and truth. Number five. Oh, we're already on number five. Singing songs. Singing songs is an important part of corporate worship. It's something God's people are expected to do. Psalm 96, 1 and 2. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord. Bless his name. Tell of his salvation from day to day. Then Psalm 46, verse 7. Sing praises to God. Sing praises. Sing praises to our king. Sing praises. Kind of got the point of that verse, right? It, three verses were commanded to sing seven times. In fact, the Bible contains over 400 references. I didn't count these. I, I believe what I read. It contains 400 references to singing, including 50 direct commands that we sing. And that includes two passages from the New Testament. Very important one, Ephesians 5, 19. We mentioned that. It says we're to be addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with our heart. And then Colossians 3, 16 says, let the word of Christ dwell in you, richly teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. 
So, so why, why does the Lord command us to sing? Uh, Bob Coughlin of Sovereign Grace Music points out <laughs> that the Bible tells us God sings. Zephaniah 3, verse 17 says, The Lord exalts over his people with loud singing. I don't know how loud God sings, but I guess the decimals are, are up there. He, he also notes that the gospel accounts us tell us that Jesus sang. And yet I think the primary reason we're instructed to sing is that the Lord recognizes or has actually intended the, that the impact of music on our minds and hearts would be something far greater than other types of communication. Uh, Martin Luther put it this way. You've heard, some of you have heard this before. It's, it's a, if, you, if you ever open that green book called the hymnal, you will see it on, on page one. He says, music is a fair and glorious gift of God. I, I would not for the world forego my humble share of music. Singers are never sorrowful, but they are merry and smile through their troubles in song. Music makes people kinder, gentler, more staid, and reasonable. I am strongly persuaded that after theology, there is no art that can be placed on the level with music. For besides theology, music is the only art capable of affording peace and joy of the heart. The devil flees before the sound of music almost as much as before the word of God. I'm not, I think there might be a little exaggeration in what Luther said, but basically he's correct. There's something about music that enables us to experience God's goodness, God's greatness in, in, in fresh ways. I, I would note two things. Uh, first of all, in the all the biblical instructions about singing, there are no instructions about using or not using any particular type of musical instruments. I know some are mentioned in the Old Testament, but those are not instructions. This is what you should use. That, that seems to be left to the worshipers. There's also nothing about any style of music other than perhaps Ephesians 5.19, every song should have a melody of some type. Uh, it, it, because it, it's the lyrics, it's, it's the lyrics, not the music or the instrumentation that usually makes some songs better than others. Secondly, the Bible indicates that everyone should participate in the singing. The commands to sing are not just to the musically gifted. Now, those uh, who are unable to carry a tune in a bucket probably should sing a little more discreetly than others. A love for neighbor may dictate that. But all of us are called to participate and to sing to the Lord. In the medieval church, the trained choirs would, would sing or, or chant the worship liturgy, which the congregation, the congregation would just sit there and listen. And because the liturgy was in Latin, the ordinary people usually didn't even understand to what they were listening. Martin Luther recognized <laughs> this was silly. He used a stronger word. But anyway, and he reintroduced congregational singing and liturgy in the people's language. And, and, and that's why the second quality of a good hymn or, or worship song, after having lyrics soaked in truth, that's most important, are the lyrics speaking the truth, the second quality is that the song is singable. We want to use songs in our worship services that you as a congregation can sing. Now, this doesn't mean there's no place for Chisholm Baptist, the Chisholm Baptist Choir. They're very important. In fact, I forgot to say this, Julie. They still have room for more members, more singers. If you want to be part of the choir, talk to Julie, talk to Rachel. They'll, they'll gladly, and again, you don't have to be that good of a singer to be part of the choir. Is that a good way to put it? Yeah, that's a good way to put it. Okay, choir, wonderful. The, the choir can be a wonderful thing. Um, an occasional soloist, a, a Christian concert, uh, th those, are, those are all really encouraging and helpful. But worship is not about performance. It's about participation. 
A worship service is not about listening to people on a stage singing praises to God. Those on the stage should be encouraging the congregation to sing and participate in worship. And yeah, it's really nice when the worship team on the platform sounds pretty good, but, but far more important is whether the people in the congregation are engaged in expressing awe and love for the Lord through their singing. And when I hear you folks here on Sunday morning doing that, which, which I often do, that, that warms my heart. <laughs> and I think it pleases God when you're singing to the Lord. Number six, worship should involve emotion, but not emotionalism. John Piper says that worship is about directing our mind's attention and our heart's affection to the Lord. And that's true. Affections or emotions are an important part of worship. Emotions like awe and love and, and joy and, and gratitude and hope, sometimes contrition. Those should all be part of worship and should be expressed through, through songs and, and prayers and, and scripture readings during the worship service. One reason why music is such an important part of worship is because it is the language of the heart. It reaches and expresses our emotions in a way that words alone usually do not. You really can't have genuine God-honoring worship without emotion. When eyes are dry and hearts are cold, worship is at best shallow and at worst, it's a case where the Lord says, Matthew 5, 15, 8, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Yet, especially in our day, we need to be wary of emotionalism that masquerades as worship. This happens when people get all hyped and really excited about the worship experience but give little thought to God. When peace, people worship but don't think about how great and good the Lord is, there's a problem. And, and it's great to have feelings of, of love and joy when you worship, but you should be able to identify why you have these feelings. What is there about the triune God and what he's done that makes you feel the way you feel? And, and if you can't answer that question, it indicates shallowness or emptiness in your worship experience. And, and folks, that is not just a problem with contemporary forms of worship. I remember a few years ago, I, a man was leaving, and at the door he said, Pastor Dan, I am so glad we sang Great is Thy Faithfulness this morning. That was my mother's favorite hymn. And every time I hear it, I just have these wonderful memories of my mom. Well, that's nice. Everyone should have good memories of, of their mom. But my fear is for that fellow, great as thy faithfulness, didn't really seem to help him worship the Lord. His mind's attention and heart's affections were directed toward his mom, not toward God. You see, friends, when an ideal disciple is worshiping, both mind and heart are engaged and are focused on the Lord. Thoughts about God by themselves do not constitute worship. Feelings about God by themselves do not constitute worship. But thoughts and emotions together can work in a way that leads to expressions of love and joy and praise to the Lord. That's the type of worship an ideal disciple wants to experience, and it's the type of worship he or she wants others, wants others to experience as well. Okay, those are six points to ponder about worship. I pray the Lord would use them to, to help you grow as a disciple who worships in spirit and in truth. But this morning, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to practice. Uh, the worship team is going to come and 
lead us in expressing our praise, our adoration, and love to the Lord as we focus our minds, attention, our hearts, affections on the Lord. And you're all going to be singing, right? Some of you will sing discreetly, but all of you will be singing as we express our praise to God.